Hi folks, thank you for joining us. We're just gonna wait a couple more minutes here as we um, give folks some time to, to get online. Okay, hello everyone, good evening, and thank you for joining us tonight. Um, I see that we still have um, folks, folks rolling in here, but we will, we will kick things off um, and people can continue to join as we go. So on behalf of Civic Action, thank you so much for being here. My name is Rebecca Clausen, and I'm the program manager of our Emerging Leaders Network. So whether you're a returning ELN member, uh, a new member, or someone just curious about joining or curious specifically about our event tonight, we're really happy to have you here with us. So I'd like to begin with a land acknowledgement. So Civic Action acknowledges that the Greater Toronto and Hamilton area is situated upon the traditional and current Indigenous territories, including the Wendat, Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, Mississaugas of the New Credit First Nation and Mississaugas of Skagog Island First Nation. The treaties that cover these territories include the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Iroquois Confederacy and the Ojibwe and Allied Nations to peaceably share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes and the Upper Canada Treaties. Today, the Greater Toronto and Hamilton area is still home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island and we recognize the historical oppression and inequalities that they continue to face. In our role as civic conveners, civic action is committed to rebuilding and renewing respectful relationships between indigenous and non-indigenous people and supporting the important work of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada. We recognize that with virtual events, folks may be joining us from different parts of our region or beyond. So please let us know where you're joining from today in the chat. So I hope everyone is looking forward to tonight's discussion. So we're going to be begin with an introduction from um, our, C our CEO at Civic Action, and then we'll move into a moderated discussion where we'll hear from our incredible panel on how they see the future of Brampton. We'll then turn to you, the audience, um, to hear your questions and pose them to our panel before we move into interactive discussion groups. Um, where we'll, we'll hear from you, Brampton-based rising leaders, um, on your thoughts and ideas on how Brampton can build back better. So I'm sure that many of us are Zoom pros by now, but I do wanna take a quick moment just to go through the features of tonight's webinar. So as we go through the panel, if you have questions for our panelists, you'll see um, at the bottom of your screen near the chat box, there's a box called Q&A. So this is where you can submit your questions and where you can also vote for other questions have been asked um, that you would like to see asked to our panel. So the more votes that a question gets, the higher up it moves in priority within the chat box. So we'll be going to the top of the chat box um, to look for which questions to ask to our panelists first. So whether you have a question or you'd like to vote for um, other questions, please check out the Q&A box. Now, if you just want to share your comments, your ideas, um, links to resources, or you're having any tech issues, you can use the chat box function. And if you would like to send a message that can be seen by everyone in the webinar, please select all panelists and attendees. Um, if you're having any technical difficulties, we do have a civic action staff member, um, the fantastic Salah on the line with us tonight to support with any tech issues. So you can message civic action underscore tech um, and he'll be happy to help you out. Finally, we do have closed captioning available on the call tonight. So if you are looking to access closed captioning, um, you'll see a box at the bottom of your screen. You can click on it and then select show subtitles. Um, and then that, uh, that should come up along the bottom of your screen for you. So with that, before we move forward tonight, the last thing I would like to share with you um, is just a, a quick overview about the Emerging Leaders Network. 
I know that we do have some new members on the line tonight. So I'd like to welcome you to the ELN and just share a little bit more about our network. So the ELN is a program under Civic Actions Leadership Foundation that connects, develops, and activates rising leaders from across the GTHA. We've been around since 2006 and we're now 2,800 rising leaders strong, representing folks from across sectors, communities, cities, and backgrounds. The ELN is free to join for anyone who identifies as a rising or aspiring leader in their industry or community. And you can join by signing up for our mailing list and you'll see the website um, right there on screen. So once you join, you get access to a network of rising leaders from across the region, as well as free monthly events um, that focus on leadership development, civic issues and city building. So we share um, registration for these events through the newsletter. Uh, and since the arrival of COVID-19, we have taken our programming online. So we offer um, webinars such as the call we're on tonight, discussion groups, digital mentorship, um, and more. So one aspect of this virtual programming has been our digital dish series. At the beginning of the pandemic, we connected with our membership through surveys and focus groups to see how you were doing and what you needed from us. And we heard that rising leaders want to be connected to decision makers and community leaders contributing their questions and voices to conversations around COVID relief, recovery, and rebuilding. So we're very excited to be taking our Digital Dish series to Brampton tonight, and we're really grateful to have all of you here with us. Now, before we jump into our panel, I'm very happy to introduce Civic Action CEO, Leslie Wu, to share some opening remarks. So over to you, Leslie. Thanks so much, Rebecca, and good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for being here. I am Leslie Wu, new CEO with Civic Action. I joined the organization in this role last fall, but really Civic Action has been part of my life for quite some time. In fact, um, there was a meeting back around around, I think it was 2005, 2006, which was actually, we didn't call it ELN then, it uh, was the, uh, the founding uh, meeting of a number of young rising leaders. I was young and rising at that time. The young part has gone away. Uh, but um, little did we know at that time how necessary the network would be to all of us and how enduring it has become uh, over all these years. And so I welcome all the new members of the network and as well um, uh, thank all the uh, existing uh, members who've been with us for a while for their commitment to uh, continuing this important um, network activity. Um, Rebecca talked about Dish Digital Dish and um, it really it has become a really important lifeline connection for so many of us who in the, uh, during the pandemic have had to uh, find different means in order to connect ourselves. And I know that this conversation this evening in Brampton uh, is one of several. We've hosted a digital dish in uh, Mississauga, in Ajax, in Hamilton, and in the city of Toronto. And every time the connections that occur are really, uh, that's the important part, the conversation, the topics, but the connections that are created. And um, moreover, an opportunity to share ideas and, and hopefully after, beyond this evening, all of you have an opportunity to continue to connect and extend the conversation. Um, I think it's really one of the most exciting things about uh, leading civic action now is the opportunity to meet so many talented, energized, committed, um, young and rising leaders who have at their heart a passion for the city and the region. And it is this that I really energizes and invigorates me. And so being part of tonight uh, is usually, and being part of all the ELN events is usually one of the highlights of my week. I wanna take a minute to thank um, uh, some important people who made tonight happen. Nicole from the ELN Executive Committee, Jai Paul, our panel moderator tonight. Uh, Jaskaran, uh, he is a discussion facilitator and both Jaipal and Jaskaran are uh, diversity fellows alumni, another um, program that we are very, very proud of. And Harpreet, a discussion fa facilitator tonight who also recently spoke at one of our ELN events. Um, thank you very much to all three of you for being here. And a special thank you to our four speakers, Marilyn, Yvonne, Gwyn and Councillor Santos for taking the time out of your busy schedules to join us tonight and to connect with the rest of the network. 
with that, uh, I'd like to let the evening get on track, hand things back over to Re Rebecca and say to all of you, thank you for being part of the civic engagement that is going to help to continue to build better, more inclusive cities. Have a good evening. Thank you so much, Leslie. We really appreciate you being here with us tonight. So now let's jump into our panel. So I'm just gonna take a minute to introduce the incredible panel of civic leaders that have joined us here tonight. So moderating our panel tonight, we have Jay Paul Massey Singh, a 2020 Civic Action Diversity Fellow and Principal at Aurora Strategy Group. Jay Paul has served on a number of community initiatives such as board chair for the Brampton Library, the chair of the City of Brampton's Action Committee on Innovation in Post-Secondary Education, and as part of projects championing, championing sustainable development and food security. Our panel speakers include Yvonne Young, an urban designer with over 20 years of international experience delivering transit-oriented communities. Yvonne is currently the manager of urban design with the city of Brampton and serves multiple leadership roles with the Urban Land Institute International Think Tank. She has received the American Society of Landscape Architects Honor Award and the University of Toronto Rotman School of Management Award. Next, we have Gwen Chapman, the Senior Advisor of Black, African, and Caribbean Social, Cultural, and Economic Empowerment and Anti-Black Racism Unit at the City of Brampton. Guided by local community stakeholders, Gwen's work is centered on uplifting the social, cultural, and economic position of Brampton's Black community. She has received the Queen's Diamond Jubilee Medal for her over 33 years of community service to Canada. We're also happy tonight to be joined by Marilyn Vergas, who is currently serving a unique portfolio at the William Osler Health System as the corporate team lead for equity, inclusion, and anti-discrimination. Marilyn is also the founder and executive director of Vision Brampton, a volunteer-led civic engagement and advocacy organization, and serves the board of the Wellfort Community Health Center. Last but not least, we have Councillor Rowena Santos, a proud Bramptonian inspired by community and driven by a passion to change the culture of politics to move the city forward. She was elected in 2018 and is the first Filipino elected to council in Brampton. She has held leadership roles across private, nonprofit, and public sectors and has mentored countless youth to be politically active across the GTA. So welcome to all of our panelists. Thank you so much for being here with us tonight and I'll turn it over to Jay Paul to kick off our discussion. Thanks so much, Rebecca. Uh, thank you. Welcome everyone to our conversation this evening and hello to our panelists. I, uh, I've gotten to know most of you uh, over the years and familiar with your work, but when Rebecca lays it all out that way, when I get to hear the, the accomplishments all uh, in a row, I'm, uh, I'm definitely feeling a little insecure being on a, on a panel with the four of you. This is a, this is a pretty power packed group. So thanks for making the time tonight. Um, we have a number of questions that we wanted to, uh, to ask and, and get your perspective on. And just as a reminder to all those attending to please add your questions to our list as the conversation unfolds. And I'll make sure that we give our panelists an opportunity to talk about the things that you're interested in hearing from them about as well. Uh, but to get things going, uh, I'll start with a question of, uh, that, we, uh, that we put together on, on the civic action side of things. And I'll, I'll start off with, uh, with Yvonne. And that's um, given the unprecedented challenges Brampton has faced over the past year, from your perspective, what do you think are community's greatest challenges and how should we best go about addressing it? I think what's interesting about challenges is that when we look at it from uh, the two sides of the con with every challenges, it also come with opportunity. And what's interesting about the city of Brampton is a very strong energy on innovation. And um, one of the um, biggest challenges that we see that which is also an opportunity uh, compared with other municipalities across the GTA is that we are very, very fast growing. So we're growing three times the provincial average. And with that, that means our average household size has increased from 2.3 people per dwellings to 3.7 people per household um, in average. So that is very, very significant. So the highest across the overall uh, region and also the province. And with that, um, from the city planning perspective, what we are focusing on is um, addressing three fundamental uh, matters. The first one is on housing. So looking at how we can promote the registration of second units, uh, thinking about um, actually uh, putting that into action and the result is uh, very successful. So we see that since we launched this 
um, uh, application, um, the overall uptake has increased by 900%. At the same time, from the uh, housing strategy perspective, our colleague is very innovative and also has come up with the idea of inventing a new typology. So we call that a new rental typology. It's a single room occupancy. So it is quite unique in Brampton in a way that we have a lot of um, young uh, post-secondary uh, education student. Um, the second component we're innovating is on education. So looking at urban community hub, looking at promoting lifelong learning, how we can um, mixing schools, library, community centers, technology, arts and culture, ecological um, living and learning and uh, creating the whole uh, neighborhood as a school. So on uh, moving forward, that's become uh, the lifeline model uh, for the neighborhood. And the last one is about health. So focusing on investing in new hospital, but not just in the infrastructure itself, but actually building a cluster around it. So it has a very strong a medical and health cluster uh, with laboratories and biotech and through that to provide the age-friendly living. So in all the pieces that we are looking at uh, the challenges, we are trying to look at the other side of the flip of the coin to provide opportunity. Cool, much appreciated. Um, Councillor Santos, I know you've been wanting to, to share an opinion here as well. How do you see challenges and opportunities fitting together? For sure, and I gotta say, I just I fit, I just finished a really long council day mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm exhausted, but I'm so energized by this panel and the topics that we're talking about. And certainly with Yvonne's comments about the opportunities that we have, you could see um, how we as a city are trying to reach the potential um, that we have as a city and using the pandemic as an opportunity to try as much as we can to expedite a lot of those things. What's really interesting is that I think uh, from my perspective as, as a resident, as a person who loves our city very much and as a person um, who sits at the council table, one of our biggest challenges is actually the perception of our city and the public perception of our city. During this entire pandemic, it, doesn't, it didn't really matter how hard we tried to get into the media, how hard we tried to get our message out about how amazing Brampton is. The reality is, is that media and public perception is constantly attacking us for, for, for all everything that's negative about our city. And that, and that has a huge impact on our own perception of how we feel about our city, whether that's on safety or how, how um, Brampton is a hot spot for, for the virus itself. Um, you know, we, we as a council, as leaders in the community are trying very hard to break through some of that challenging messaging and branding about Brampton. And it's sometimes really difficult to a point where I think sometimes residents themselves start to believe that um, Brampton is, is not a good place to be. And, and certainly we on this panel don't believe that to be so. So I think one of the biggest challenges for us is not necessarily being able to have the political will or the leadership at this table or community leaders to implement the opportunities we have. It's more about how do we break through so that these good stories about our city are shared mm -hmm. throughout the whole country. Um, and, and we are used as a model uh, for different things and not necessarily as, as, you know, the city where the virus is or the city where all the crime is or the city where all the issues are. And I'll speak to that a little bit later because it fund I think it fundamentally also has to do with some level of um, discrimination and, anti and, and racism that people don't want to talk about when it comes to Brampton. Marilyn, we've been talking about themes around healthcare, perception, um, you know, uh, communities maybe being marginalized here. I trust these are themes that, that you can build on. Yeah, absolutely. What Councillor Santos just said really kind of sparked a reflection in me, which is that absolutely, I think in the in the cultural imaginary of the GTA, Brampton tends to get this very negative narrative. And I couldn't agree with you more that it's actually steeped in a lot of misunderstandings and, and some fundamentally discriminatory racist views about the communities here. What we see as assets at Vision Brampton, which are you know, the diversity that we have in our community, 75% people of color, no other city in this country can claim something that special. We see that as an asset. And I think over the last year, some of the narratives that have come out of the pandemic, the hotspot, that language really reifies um, 
exclusionary narratives. It really reifies racist imaginations about what, what goes on here. And that's not been my experience, certainly not with Vision Branton and not with the work that I do at Osler. I think more than anything, our community is profoundly resilient, that we do so much um, and we lift each other up as much as we can. And absolutely, there are tensions uh, you know, that we have to address. There are limitations that we need to build resources for. But the narrative, I think, sometimes becomes about Brampton being this hot spot, and it's our fault that we had such high rates of COVID. There are so many social and economic reasons why COVID was patterned the way that it was. And I know that there are people who are going to be moderating our discussion questions who have really brought a lot of amazing thought leadership to that. Shout out to Jess Curran, because there was some amazing discourse that came out of um, his leadership in advocating for a more race justice uh, lens to how we talk about COVID in this community. Thanks, Marilyn. Gwen, I'm, I'm interested in your perspective on this piece, you know, the, the broader perception of how Brampton is, is seen as part of the GTA and how much of that in your perception and experience, quite frankly, is based on the racial composition of our community and how people perceive um, that component when they judge Brampton as a whole. You know, it's so interesting. Thank you. Um, uh, I think about the Black community and um, I'm looking at how Brampton is perceived. Um, I've always said, you know, the Black community is one of the best kept secrets in Canada. Why? Because I understand, um, you know, the value that we bring to the table. I understand the untapped potential that we have. And I understand that we have a challenge in terms of getting our stories, our stories of resilience and contributions to, to this country and to the world basically, and to highlight the people that are doing great things. And, and so, you know, Brampton also has this challenge because um, yes, it's, it's, it's tiny compared to the GTA, but I believe that one of the things that we really have to work on is getting the message out there and reminding people about the resiliency that, that uh, thrives in Brampton, the rich cultural um, aspects of Brampton and all that we have that, that, that makes this city vibrant. And um, I am looking forward to finding ways to help promote who we are collectively in the same way that I'm trying my best to find ways to promote who we are in terms of the black community. Because if we are not seen for who and, and who we are and what, what the value that we have, um, you know, it's, it's, it's an unfortunate thing. And, and I think that we have to do a lot more work in terms of working with the media to get the message out there about the untapped talent, the potential of our city. And um, it's something, like I said, we're looking forward to working on. And um, I'm excited about the possibilities. And I do believe that every challenge brings out the best in us. And this is an opportunity Honestly, I really feel that for us to really shine and put our hands together, our heads together, and just blow this place out of the water, period. <laughs> and, and, and if I may, just very, very quickly, and, and to Gwyneth's point and, and Marilyn's point, this is why um, the opportunities that Yvonne shared in the very beginning, like these are the things, these are the hopeful things about our city that we are working on that people don't know about. It's, it's the untapped talent and skills and young people who are putting this vision of our city together with Yvonne and her team. And, 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 but instead, we're, we're constantly kind of reported as being something else or being the sore thumb of the GTA. Um, and so I think that we as a community, and thank you to ELN, for sharing and, and allowing Brampton to share our story and be honest about where we are as a community. I, I, I love that perception and, and I like that thought. And, and I just, I'm gonna ask you to build on a little bit more, Councillor Santos, if you don't mind. You know, when we think about, you know, moving ahead and, and whether we're talking about building back better from a COVID perspective or whether we're just talking about the ongoing evolution and growth of our community, you know, one of the things that I wonder about, you know, given my level of community involvement is, you know, do we always have the right people at the table? Do we always have everyone engaged in the conversation who needs to be part of the conversation? And then so when we're talking about some of the ideas you're talking about here, um, I'm gonna ask you, you know, are we engaging all the right people or, or what do we need to be doing better to engage the right people into the conversation? And, and by better, when I, be, I mean, I say the right people, what I mean is as many people as we can, quite frankly. 
Yeah, and and I agree with you. It's always, um, you know, when it, what what Marilyn said about being seventy five percent visible minorities, it's it's such a tremendous asset. At the same time, it also creates layers of um, not complication, but but layers of um, how we engage everybody, right? Like how within in in the seventy five percent, how do you capture all of those diverse perspectives? in every single decision. It, it, it is difficult and by no means is there any level of perfection as we engage more people in the process. What I will give is an example of how we have managed as a city to really start to engage voices at the table and what that collaboration has meant for the city. Um, I'm gonna give the example of active transportation and, and the bike lanes in Branton and the pandemic being an opportunity to really start to shift the culture away from a driver obsession culture to one that is more sustainable. And in the past, the cycling community um, was not necessarily engaged in decisions related to active transportation. There were a lot of silos between um, what the city was doing, what council was thinking and what the community wanted. And in this term of council, we, even before the pandemic, we made it very, spe we specifically said, we need to hear these voices who are the cycling activists, the environmental activists at the table mm -hmm. um, to be part of the planning process. And in fact, we went so far as to say, we want the community to own the plan. We want the community to own the plan and be the ones to share ownership of that plan and, and staff, council, the, the community organizations collaborated together. And today we presented an update on the active transportation master plan and every single one of those community organizations, including the David Suzuki Foundation, were highly supportive and celebrating what we were doing on sustainable active transportation. That is a huge win when it comes to transforming you know, the possibilities for Brampton emerging and building back better when it comes to climate change and especially um, sustainable development and active transportation. That's, that's an awesome story. Thank you for sharing it here. Uh, Gwen, you wanted to add something? Yes, you know, I, I, I just have to say that I am so inspired. I am so encouraged by the, the councillors, the mayor of the city of Brampton, the planning department at the city of Brampton, their vision of, of, of diversity and their vision of inclusivity, they're not just talking the talk, they're walking and they're doing and they're putting their money where their mouth is. And I am just, again, very impressed um, with the work that uh, Yvonne, your department is doing to include everyone. Um, Council, I just had to say that because um, I mean, I've been around for a while. I may look young, but I'm not that young. Um, but I have been in situations, I've watched, you know, um, many leaders who they may say they want to do something, but they don't step up and follow up. And so I always feel it's important to highlight when people are doing the right thing, when people are including all communities, when people are doing the courageous Thing. And, and Councillor Rowena, you're here, but you don't have a lot of admiration for you and, and the work that you do. And Yvonne, you're just a breath of fresh air in terms of your leadership in, 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 in the planning and the 2040 vision for Brampton. It's powerful. It's inspiring. And I think it's really important to allow for more of our young people in Brampton to see and be engaged in what you're doing to show that they are included and that they're important and you want to inspire them to believe that there can be a greater vision, you know, and, and, and just give them more opportunities and hope for the future. So I have to just jump in there and uh, share how inspired I am by the work that both of you are doing. Well, Yvonne, you're getting all these shout outs now. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna put you on the spot. And, and like when, usually when I interact with you, it's in some kind of public forum where you're engaging people in, in the plans of the city and, and soliciting feedback. So why don't you share a little bit more about, you know, stakeholder engagement is, is kind of what you do. Uh, how can, where are we winning and, and where can we be doing better as a community? And where do you see all this going as it pertains to the future of Brampton? 
that's a question for me. That's a question for you. <laughs> okay. Yes. Sorry. Um. There's a little bit of delay in the video, so I'm getting like a two second delay. Um. So I think what is what is very interesting about um uh, the messaging that is hidden in Brampton, a lot of people don't know about. We're actually um is very forward thinking and investing in a lot in technology, and in a, in investing a lot in youth. And a lot of the planning case study we're looking at at the moment, we have attract interest from UN habitats, um, from Harvard University, from city from all over the world. Look at it as the best practices, but it's not just talking about it, but actually doing it. And then at the engagement level, um, um, during the pandemic, we have tried three um, um, uh, different aspects and it's quite successful. The first one is um, we're actually the first um, one in the province to launch this uh, virtual inspection platform. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that is a, a really uh, early adopters. And through that, we're able to achieve 24% um, more um, inspection compared to uh, the pre um, uh, pandemic time. And secondly, is that within a month, very quickly, we pivot to um, uh, having the application development application review online. And through that platform, we're also uh, launching uh, using the 3D model and 2D collages and having the co-design session. And I think uh, what we were talking about in terms of engaging the youth is that uh, in October, we partner with Urban Land Institute uh, on doing a, a, a big scale kind of workshop, uh, inviting uh, 200 members um, of uh, different uh, backgrounds and diversity and also engaging the youth. And what we did is that uh, we asked the youth to put together a video and tell us about um, how do they see a particular uh, neighborhood um, uh, can transform in the future and use that to uh, position the centralized of the conversation. So all of these uh, happen during pandemic. And I think from that perspective, um, there's absolutely uh, more to come. Once the lockdown is uh, over, um, we'll be innovating a lot more. Cool, thanks. That's, that's amazing, but the sheer number of initiatives there. Marilyn, you wanted to add something as well? Yeah, I was just reflecting on Gwen and Yvonne's comments about um, getting stakeholders engaged in the work that City Hall is doing and, and how do we build the kind of civic spaces that we want to be a part of. And that's really a lot of the work that Vision Branton was thinking about before the pandemic is not just about civic engagement for young people, but civic inclusion. That beyond just getting out more people to vote, more people to show up to deputations at City Hall to pay attention to the budgets, how do we actually increase the inclusion of historically marginalized voices to Gwyn's point, right? Or, or young people as a, as a group that haven't historically felt that they've had a lot of access to city hall and to participate in civic dialogue in the same way here as maybe other cities where there's a little bit more urban density, people don't feel as um, isolated at times. And I think this actually emerged as a bit of a challenge during the pandemic for ourselves. We had to take a bit of a step back that um, so much of our work was focused on civic spaces being physical space, that we actually take up physical space and show up at these meetings and, um, and host events. And that's what brought people together in, and, in trying to combat that, the, the kind of isolation that some of us felt. But the pandemic prof profoundly kind of shifted how we thought about civic space. And we're now in that space of thinking of what are the opportunities in this virtual world of building civic space that is truly inclusive in a way that we were not able to when there were those limitations of being in person if you want to participate in something. Um, and so just as you both were speaking, I was reflecting on that distinction that we've always driven at Vision Brampton between uh, civic engagement being a great standard, but civic inclusion being almost uh, even almost a little bit more exciting that all of these voices that have not traditionally been heard now have an opportunity to be heard. Um, and that was something that I've been reflecting on myself over this pandemic. It's such a subtle, but such a powerful turn of phrase. I really appreciate that. If I, if I could ask you to, to build on that idea a little bit further, if you don't mind, you were talking about, you know, just one of the ways that life has changed over the past year and how we have to rethink some of our strategic ideas. You talked about space, but you know, mm -hmm. there's a whole bunch of things that have happened. We were talking about COVID, uh, issues of, 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 of racism, anti-Black racism in our community and so forth. Are we at a point where we need to start rethinking um, or revisiting our 2040 vision at all? Is, is, this, is now a time to like, has what's happened in the past year been so seismic that we need to start thinking not just in the next two or three years, but you know, has, has, our, has our longer term destination had to shift because of what we we're experiencing now? 
And any, anything else there, Marilyn? Sorry, Marilyn, I, I meant it for you. I apologize. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I think the word that you used is exactly the right one. It, this has been a seismic shift, not just in our human experiences, but also in our consciousness. I think the really profound discourse that has emerged out of this pandemic is just how central issues of equity are. Um, and so being an organization that really advocates for equity, you know, diversity is what we have in Brampton, but how do we get to that place of inclusion? Well, equity is what tells us how to get there. And so for me, what I've been reflecting on both from the perspective of Osler and from the perspective of Vision Brampton is building back with that equity by design, that we're, we're really reframing the questions that we're asking and thinking really critically about the opportunity that this moment has given us, that it's kind of ground us all to a halt. And through this experience, what has come forward is what's really important to us. Um, you know, you take away all of the other pretensions of life prior to the pandemic, and you have this profound seismic shift in, in what our values are. And I think what a lot of young people are saying, certainly in my circles, what keeps emerging is that the world that we design moving out of this space, the city that we build moving out of this space has to be equitable. It has to be truly inclusive. And what does that look like from a public policy perspective? What does that look like from a civic space perspective? And what does that look like in terms of whose voices we can now deliberately seek out and include who have not yet been part of some of those conversations? Um, so yeah, I, I, I cannot imagine a future that doesn't consider that particular seismic shift in our consciousness. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Santos, I, I know this is something that's near and dear to you as you're living and breathing it at City Hall every day. You know, what, what does the future hold for Brampton and in what ways do we need to rethink our future given what we've gone through the past year? Yeah, and, and Marilyn, you're amazing. I uh, just want to say that. Um, the, Marilyn brought up some, some very interesting points when it comes to equity and inclusion and policy and what that means for the future of Brampton. With respect to, the, to Vision 2040, I think that um, using an equity lens, and I know that Yvonne definitely is doing that in the work that she's doing, we, we also do it through Nurturing Neighborhoods, the program where we are in the community talking to residents about their neighborhoods in a very intimate way uh, when it comes to planning. But there are two things that come to mind for Brampton when it comes to equity and inclusion. Um, and our, our population and, and the future. One is on healthcare. And I know that recently we got the second hospital announced, um, which is nice. Um, but what, what I will say is that that was an announcement that is the basic fundamental need for our city. And so, and Brenton deserves it. And so, and so while while we um, celebrate the fact that that announcement was made, the reality is, is we've been waiting for a really long time. And, and it took a pandemic to highlight that we needed a second hospital. And we watch other municipalities um, that are smaller than ours, that have more hospitals and more capacity than we do. And so when we talk about diversity, equity and inclusion, when it comes to advocating to the provincial and federal government, we must, as a community with the 75% visible minorities that we represent, we must demand more because that the second hospital was fine, but we de demand more. Another interesting point is that we are, again, one of the most youngest, one of the most diverse municipalities, large municipalities in the entire country. We are the only large municipality that does not have our own university. And our young people, our parents, who, who many of them who came from another country to Canada to build a better life for their kids, have to send their kids to another city in order to go to school. And why is that? And so, you know, we, we are working on the Brampton University project, and it was really great to have the medical school announced, but our city, our residents deserve our own university. Um, and so these are two big things um, that really point to some fundamental issues that Marilyn was talking to when it comes to our city's fight and advocacy for inclusion and our fair share. Um, and so, you know, the, I, I wanted to share that because I'm very passionate about the fact that our city, our residents, all of you deserve a lot more than, than what we have been getting a decade after decade. Thank you. 
I appreciate that 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 passion for it, and 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 you know that that piece around you know what what Brampton deserves. I think is is one of those underlying themes that you know creates that tension in this community of of you know making sure we're advocating well. You know, coming back to the theme that we started this whole piece off around, right? What is the story out there that people believe about Brampton, and and you know fundamentally knowing what a community deserves and having the people of that community believe that they deserve that. I think is a big part of how that story, you know, does or doesn't get told. So I appreciate you bringing that passion to remind us, you know, that that the city does deserve, this community deserves more than it gets sometimes. I, I really appreciate that passion. Uh, Yvonne, yeah, I'm going to share one final thing about yeah. that because somebody, a young person who is a young Filipino had a conversation with me about this and it has to do with the anti-Asian racism a little bit as well. And she mentioned to me that as, as a Filipino cult culture and perhaps some other newcomer and immigrant cultures as well, when we first come to Canada, we are told not to say anything. We are told not to speak up. We are told not to complain because we are lucky to be here. And, and, I, I, and, and that may be perhaps part of the reason why we are constantly taken for granted or for advantage of because we were told just to put your head down and get to work. Don't worry about you know what you get, what you don't get. Don't complain because you're just lucky to be here. And I, and I'm saying that no, no, Brampton deserves more. No, you, you, there, I mean we can have a whole second webinar, uh, whatever this is like a workshop conversation about unpacking the immigrant experience and the stories our parents tell us and and uh, and how that affects how we how we interact as Canadians going forward. Absolutely. And, uh, but I want to make sure we're getting to a, a bit of a breadth of topics as well. Uh, Yvonne, I think you wanted to weigh in on this particular one. Yes. Yeah, so I think what's very interesting is that since COVID, we've been seeing a lot of messaging international think tank, particularly trying to solve some systematic issues. And this is really coming down to equity. So I remember uh, Malcolm Gladwell talks about how city building is a soccer game. So to win is not focusing on star player, but everybody need to be a star player. And what is really compelling about Vision 2040 is really fundamentally looking at how we can make the shift from a car oriented edge city of 0.6 million to a city of transit oriented communities for over a million and using that as a model to really get to the root of the problem. So the first thing is in terms of uh, affordability and equity, uh, creatively removing the need of a vehicle because the cost is very high. And at the same time, it doesn't give people the freedom to travel around. So that's the fundamental difference between a lifestyle in the North American lifestyle versus in the European lifestyle is the sense of freedom. So by doing that um, from a fundamental perspective is, um, is, a, is a very tangible way to improve equity. And then the second thing is uh, really focusing on age friendly and family. And I think this is uh, thinking about investing in the future and bringing those uh, voices early on at the table, like what Councillor Sandler has talked about is very important to bring um, um, the activists at the table, uh, those that too have uh, really passion about the city and for the future uh, to be part of uh, the decision making process. Go on. Hi, I just wanted to, again, um, uh, let uh, Councillor Rorini understand how I appreciate her passion and her commitment to do this work. Because without people like her in positions of influence and leadership, it's very difficult to move things and, and to create these opportunities where we can actually set in policies, pass council resolutions and so forth, that will bring about positive change. And it takes people who are courageous and who are committed you know, to doing the right thing again, to step up. So uh, I, I really truly appreciate, um, Councillor, your um, commitment to this work. And um, I'm hoping that her passion um, is going to inspire a lot of those that are on this call and uh, you younger people in the city of Brampton, that um, you know you are part of the change and that you have the power in your hands to make things happen, to change the future. This is your city. This is your city and you have to demand that you are represented and that your needs as a community is fulfilled. So again, thank you, um, Councilor Marina. And, and I just had to jump in there because 
it's not often that we have people standing up, sticking up and, you know, just being so diligent with the task at hand. And I appreciate you. And if I, if I can build on what you just said there, Gwen, I, I just want to point out and, and flag this, you know, the, the, the premise under which we're convening tonight is part of an emerging leaders network. And, and, you know, part of this is about inspiring and providing information and hopefully um, some um, ideas and, and, and inspiration to, to uh, up and coming uh, leaders in our community. And I just want to say, when I see uh, a panel of, like this, who's taking the time to show real leadership, and I don't mean just in the, in the context of sharing your ideas, but the way that you're cheering for one another, supporting one another, um, you know, giving one another credit uh, for what each of you is contributing to the community. That's real leadership. And I'm hoping that those who are attending this call are also not just listening to the words you're saying, but paying attention to the way that you're demonstrating leadership and support for one another, because that's what real leaders do. And I just want to make sure that the four of you are getting acknowledged for that. It's wonderful to watch. With, uh, with that, I'm going to do a, a slight pivot in, in, in the topics, just because we have a lot of stuff we want to cover. And, uh, and so I'm just going to take a little bit of a turn here, and I'm going to pass a question over to you, Gwen. And that is, what is it that we need to be, a theme throughout the conversation tonight has been around, you know, uh, um, racism and the perception of, of people in our community um, and, and racialized individuals in our community. And, and I just want to you know, be as blunt as I can about this particular topic because we're talking around it. And that is, what do we need to be doing better as a community to be addressing racism, whether we're talking anti-Black racism, anti-Asian racism, anti-South Asian racism in this community? And, and, and in particular, and this is just uh, one piece I want to add in, for a community that, that you know, uses diversity as our strength as, as part of its call line, I don't know that we always understand quite what that means in this community. And I just want to turn it over to you for your perception on that. Um, thank you for that uh, very important question. Um, just want to let uh, those on the call know that um, we, the, 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 council, the council did, we did pass um, the motion to have an equity office established for the first time at the city of Brampton. And um, the equity office will host the African, um, a Black African Caribbean social cultural, basically my unit. Um, and it's going to be responsible as well for the indigenous uh, communities um, uh, the, and, and, and all those that uh, uh, need to have proper representation. Um, I, I had something written out there, but I'm, I'm gonna just skip past that. I feel um, that question about what do we need to do in order for us to get rid of racism and I was on a podcast with um, uh, someone. They asked the same question. And you know, the bottom line, as simple as this sound, is to respect each other. We need to understand and learn how to respect each other. I was writing a piece um, many, many years ago and there's a, an, an 11 year old um, kid with me at the time. And I was writing um, um, a, a, a poem almost for someone you know, uh, to recite. And you may have heard of Ruben Hurricane Carter um, who was wrongly convicted for 20 years. And um, uh, he had the story, the hurricane named after him starring Denzel Washington. But during our conversations, we were talking about wars and all the stuff that's happening, which is just awful. This kid who was beside us in the room said, you know what? The problem is with all these wars and, 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 and terrible things that's going on, people don't respect each other. And that was profound coming from a young person. The fact is we need to learn to respect each other. Respecting each other means I see value in you. I see who you are. And whatever we need to do collectively as a community, as a society, that will help us to really start looking at individuals as unique additions to our life, to the cities, to the country. Basically, we're all children of God. You know, we've got to get back to humanity. 
And um, this is something that we kind of, you know, in the past, we kind of move, move it aside and we get involved in all types of other things. But the point is we got to get back to that because a lot of the wars that's taking place around the world, people have no respect. Some of those leaders have no respect for others. They hate others because they come from a different background. They have a uh, different color skin, different hair. What is that all about? I don't understand. You know, we all unique, but just like a garden, we've, we, we are different flowers and we bring that beauty to this world. And so again, it goes back down to, we've got to learn to respect each other. And we've got to understand that everyone has value and everyone has something great to contribute to this city, to Brampton, to the province, to Canada, to the world, period. So we need to elevate our thinking. There's a lot of things that we could put in place, policies, strategies, action plans, all kinds of plans, and the list goes on. But you know what? If we're not reflective and we're not looking really and assessing who we are as, as, as people, as a person, we will continuously have this issue. So we've got to find all these wonderful people out there that are able to get us to stop and think. And maybe the COVID and everything that's happening right now allows us this opportunity to pause and understand how valuable each other is, basically. We are going nuts because we can't see each other. We can't be around each other. So maybe we'll have a better appreciation of the fact that we all are connected. The fact that we are all children of this planet and we belong together. We want to have and create a more peaceful, thriving, positive and, and wonderful world. And again, for you young people that are on this call, you have to take some time to ask yourself some serious questions. What are you doing? How are you treating others? How are you trying to make this world a better place? And like I said, there's a lot of actions and policies that, that have to be put in place, but the bottom line, it goes down to humanity, humanity and respecting each other. Thanks, Gwen. That, that, that's, uh, I love your passion on this topic. Uh, Marilyn, did you want to add some more into this as well? Yes, I was just, I was so swept up in the message I was delivering. I, I didn't take myself off mute for a second there. I just wanted to build on this idea um, and, to, and to challenge us a little bit that we can also think about racism. And I think Gwen was really talking about that interpersonal experience of racism and challenging ourselves to build the knowledge and confront our biases that we challenge our interpersonal racism. I think to your question, J. Paul, there's also a structural element of racism that we experience in Brampton. And for folks who aren't familiar with that distinction, right, coronavirus was a great example of that. The policy was, was race neutral. It was not written in a way that was intended to produce this profound injustice that we witnessed, but the consequence of a race neutral policy still produced a really highly racialized outcome in terms of our uh, infection rates, right? 83% of people in the greater Toronto area who got sick with COVID were people of color. And that is an injustice in and of itself, even though there's not sort of a, a boogeyman racist behind that, there's a structural impact of the way that our societies are patterned that produced race injustice without that. I think it's Ibram, uh, Ibram Kendi who said that any policy that isn't actively confronting racism is necessarily sustaining it. And there are opportunities for us to develop policy solutions that remedy the injustices that we see even when the policy as written is not racist, when it's race neutral, but produces an unjust outcome. And so for myself, and you know, certainly I think a lot of people who are interested in sort of civic spaces, the question becomes, what are the policy opportunities to address not just the interpersonal racism that many of us experience, but also the structural racism that Brampton experiences in many ways and that different communities of color within Brampton experience in different ways. And, and I think that gets at the real question for me that J. Paul was asking, which is we, we see diversity as a strength here, but diversity is just essentially what we have. And is there an opportunity to think about that diversity and think, well, what is the equity policy prescription that'll help all of us get a little bit more justice 
for the space that we occupy in this city. And that's something I've been pondering and I don't have answers to, but I've, I've been pondering a little bit from a policy perspective. No, I, I totally appreciate you, you, you putting that other lens on it. And, and I think it's, it's really important that, and I really appreciate how you and Gwen both address that question. There is a, there is a personal element to it. And then there is a, a systemic and structural element. And, and unless we're addressing both, we're not really making the headway that we need to make as a, as a society. Uh, Councillor Santos, you've been nodding along this conversation. I trust you have something you want to add as well. Yeah, see it, sisters. My gosh. And, and Gwen, um, you know, you, you're, you're very modest. You, you've been having a lot of very uncomfortable conversations um, at the city of Rampton on, on, um, internally as, as we reflect on uh, at the city how to improve on some of those structural issues related to racism that Marilyn is talking about. And I think, you know, to just to kind of tie in this conversation, I, I think that in addressing the structural racism and just the racism that exists, period, number one, it's an ongoing journey. And, you know, we're always learning and we're always making mistakes. We, we recently on council last month had to reverse a decision around the naming of a park because the community spoke up and we said, you know what, you're right, we heard you. We're, gonna, we're, we're not gonna go there. Um, but I think one of the things, too, is that we have to call it out. We cannot be afraid to just call it out. And, and, and it's uncomfortable, I hear you. But even structural racism, we just need to call it out um, just so that it could come to the surface in the same way that it was called out about the naming of that park. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we can't shy away from it. So I, I will leave that, I leave that there. Like very recently on, on the last weekend, I was in an email exchange with somebody who was um, prompting online bullying and prompting anti-Asian racism on a Facebook or on, on an Instagram post. And my, my gut reaction was I should just scroll on. But then I said, no, I'm not gonna scroll on. I'm gonna call this out because it's, it's, there's, there's enough scrolling on that happens um, when it comes to structural racism and when it comes to just racism in general. So we, we just cannot be afraid to call it out because when we call it out, then we can actually do something about it. Yeah, I just have a, a few thoughts I want to share too. And I think the experience is starting with young. So when the child is two days old, that's when we start to nurture this mindset, thinking about global competency, thinking about global citizenship thinking about you are not alone in the planet. Like in other words, um, there is vibrancy and it's exciting when you are in that kind of mix. So I think uh, from that uh, standpoint, uh, Brampton definitely uh, have a lot of um, uh, story in here, compelling story, very successful uh, first generation of immigration story that worth to be uh, told and retold. And I think collectively is also uh, finding a way to understand about empathy how do we apply empathy in every piece that we are doing? Just simply putting ourselves into other people's shoes. Imagine yeah. what would be the life is 15 years from now, using that to set a perspective. What if I'm that person 15 years from now, what do I want to feel and see around um, that environment? I think that is gonna really fundamentally drive our decision making process and making uh, these uh, changes come alive. And I think from a planning standpoint, because we see the numbers coming in, we know that the uh, Greater Golden Horseshoe is growing very fast and very diverse. And majority of the growth, they are international population. Like mm -hmm. in other words, it's a matter of time that we're going to see a extremely rich mix across uh, beyond Brampton. So in other words, what Brampton is doing here is innovating is that we're informing some of the new changes that we need to prepare for. And, uh, and uh, by uh, walking the talk and with this uh, progressive set of leadership in here, I think uh, it's very exciting to um, see um, taking action very, very rapidly. Thank you. I, I wanna make sure we're, we're leaving some time for questions that are coming from our audience. We got a lot of engaged folks uh, watching. And, and one of the questions, actually the one that, that got the most upvotes is a, is, a, is a segue right from the conversation we're having right now. If we're talking about uh, systemic uh, uh, and, and structural issues around race in our community, uh, you know, Yvonne, I think you did a lovely job of bringing that home talking about, you know, it starts with, with our youngest people first. The, the question that Linda posted was, there's a lot of work happening to address anti-Black racism in the school system in Peel. How do you leverage that work to benefit Black communities in Brampton more broadly? 
Um, Gwen, can I, I get you to start on that one? How can we work with some of the successes we're having in other areas of our community into, into the rest of the community? You, you know what? It's not a matter of how, it's a matter of when. Um, this is a conversation that's taking place right now. And, um, you know, it, it, it's something that we're looking forward to, um, especially for myself. I'm very, very passionate about young people. And unfortunately with COVID, I, I was hoping to, to um, have the opportunity to go to every school and, and have a, a dialogue and, and let our young people know how important they are to us and that we want to work really hard to ensure that they are empowered, included, and they feel valued. Um, so these are conversations that we're having right now as we speak. Um, it's a work in progress. Um, our unit has, is, is still in the developmental stages, but right now these are conversations that we are having with our um, educational institutes and, and, and we're gonna be having um, actually more conversations with young people um, and uh, we did have a, a conference for youth in uh, the month of February, but um, this area in terms of leveraging what's happening with the schools and supporting um, uh, the, the events, the, the initiatives, um, um, it, is, it is exciting for me. And as I said, this is something that we, we're in the process of developing and, and um, I'm, I'm really excited and I look forward to the positive and progressive changes that's gonna come about as we collaborate with each other. Wonderful. And, and on this idea of, of sort of building on these sort of centers of excellence within our community, Marilyn, there's, there's a lot of great work that's been done at Osler as well around the issue of, of racialized communities within Brampton and receipt of services and so forth. Anything we can be learning, anything you think we should be pulling from or learning from there as a community? Are we, is there an interaction between the healthcare sector and, and other parts of our community we should be thinking about? Absolutely. I mean, I think um, Osler is uniquely positioned in a way that unlike a lot of organizations that actually started this work in that in that global reckoning we all had with the tragic murder of George Floyd, Osler has had a patient facing equity and inclusion office for 13 years now. So mm -hmm. the department is specially dedicated to supporting patients in our communities who face any equity barrier um, in accessing health care services equitably and having their whole patient experience seen through that lens. Um, certainly the, the design of that portfolio is to improve the health outcomes of communities of all different needs in our in our local catchment area, but also to steward that patient experience that should you ever need somebody to support you because you have uh, some part of yourself that you're nervous bringing into the healthcare system, which can feel exclusionary, it can feel dangerous, it can feel unsafe, depending on what your relationship is to the healthcare system. We Having an, an office dedicated to supporting you under the patient experience team is actually a tremendous testament to how much Osler values that. Um, every organization has a long way to go, of course, but having that for 13 years, that's a really strong legacy. It was one of the reasons why I was happy to work in, uh, in I was thrilled to be able to work in Brampton because there was a portfolio like that that spoke to my values. And then as a stakeholder in this community, we grew up watching that hospital get built and that we are all in our lifetime going to have to go to our local hospitals. As a stakeholder, it's a really, it's a real profound, um, I, there's profound gratitude that a portfolio like that exists in the hospital. And I'm really grateful to be able to serve the community through that particular portfolio. Yeah. No, I appreciate that. And, 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 and I just wanted to highlight that. I, I suspected your answer was going to go in that direction. And I think it's important that we recognize that there are these centers of excellence and there are these, mm -hmm. these groups who are doing really great work in our community. When we talk about the larger systemic issues that Brampton faces, you know, I, I think it's important that we recognize it, it's not an across the board uh, it's, it's across the board that we all have to work together to solve the problem, but not everyone in the community is at an equal place in terms of their willingness or readiness to take on the challenges. And I think sometimes it is, you know, to the question that was brought up from the audience member, you know, it, it's, it's incumbent upon us to look at to where good work is being done and how we can leverage that good work. 
And just to build on what you said, Jay Paul, I think the other really unique asset of that portfolio is that we partner actively with the community, which I think is was part of what you originally asked, is that so many community organizations that traditionally would, would be seen outside of the scope of what a hospital does are actively partnered with Osler as an organization through our portfolio. Among them, some of the leading organizations that I know Gwen will know intimately, you know, Roots Community Services, a tremendous organization that has been around for a very long time. You may know it by its former name, uh, United Achievers, but recently rebranded as Roots. And the kind of advocacy that the executive director, Angela Carter, has done for the Black community in Brampton for a long time as a partner of the healthcare system to build inclusion for Black patients in particular is, is exactly the kind of collaboration that I think makes Osler a different sort of patient experience that we're able to offer. We partner actively with all of these community leaders to make the most inclusive patient experience, and that's a long legacy. Um, this is not a new portfolio here, so I'm proud to be a part of that work. No, much appreciated. Awesome. Yeah. Yvonne, you wanted to chime in, and I think you yeah. probably engage with uh, as many stakeholders in this community as anyone does. Uh, what, what would you like to share? I think I want to share uh, three good news stories. So this is a uh, really um, modelizing uh, uh, planning. So in the past, when planning is trying to understand uh, what is the on the ground landscape, not necessarily we look at the market data, but we begin to look at, for example, embryonics. Um, really understanding what is um, the, the makeup of the community out there. And through that, uh, we are now working on a couple of live projects. One of them is uh, collaborating with uh, PO uh, Region uh, School Board um, and focusing on how we can create this kind of inclusive environment. Like in other words, it could be designing a portion of the facilities um, so that it cater to a different kind of lifestyle. Another part is that uh, doing a survey, business survey, particularly focusing on partnering. Uh, so we talk about Roots, uh, we talk about Angela, we talk about um, other community and it's really trying to get granular in the kind of on the ground. So tap into a lot of the channel that in a traditional sense, we're not able to get to. So I think there's definitely strengths through this pandemic experience, we are building this uh, pipeline. And on moving forward, um, our city uh, official plan, the Brandon plan is launching soon. And through that, we'll be taking the engagement to the next level. So potentially, um, ideally, maybe repeating the story that uh, when Larry Beasley come and uh, designing the whole uh, Vision 2040 uh, with a business community, with the local community, with members of council, uh, bring a really impressive, uh, progressive uh, teams of uh, leadership in here that potentially uh, can build that uh, legacy um, uh, onwards. Yeah. So so we're on, this, on, on a roll of telling great stories of, of successes in the community. Rowena, do you have one more you want to add? I, I trust you do. Yeah, of course. I, I just, I, I'd like to say that, you know, Marilyn and Glenn and Yvonne have brought up some really good examples. And I think the, to the point of making sure that the community and stakeholders are engaged in the process, my story is this. Um, as a leader in, in Brampton, as a board member of FCM, I still walk into rooms as the only person of color. And, and part of the importance of us as leaders in the community is to make sure that there is space for other voices, other perspectives to be at that table. And, and, and so, you know, when, when Marilyn at, at Osler are inviting people like Angela Carter to participate in the process of what Osler is doing on healthcare or when Yvonne invites young people and people who are from the diverse community from the ground to engage in the planning process, that is making space at the table to allow for those perspectives to be incorporated with how we build for the future. Because I tell you, in many of the rooms I walk into, it's still, it's still full of one perspective, which is usually uh, the white male perspective. Um, and so the work you are doing, that, that's when, it, when the, the stories from our community, the voices, the diverse perspectives from the ground are that much more important to be elevated at the decision-making table. No, much appreciated. And, and, and you know, as, as someone who finds myself oftentimes in a similar situation, you know, one of the things I've, I've often done as part of my leadership journey in the community, when I measure was I impactful in the role that I had, the first thing I always look to is, were there more diverse voices when I left the organization than at the time that I arrived? And, and if that's the case, then I feel like I've added something of value 
by being that first person through the door. I think that's that's one of the responsibilities you have. So I, I appreciate that you're acknowledging it and also seeing it as an opportunity to make change, not, not just lamenting the fact that not enough changes happen yet. Um, I just wanna, with, with, with time being what it is, I wanna get one last question in and it, it's from, uh, from one of our audience members again. And I think really is, is bringing it back to where we started from. It is kind of the theme of the night. We've jumped over a bunch of different things uh, in terms of you know, challenges in the community, some of the opportunities, how we get more people engaged, how we might wanna think about attacking and challenging racism. But where we started this whole conversation was you know, the stories that people tell about Brampton and why are we not hearing the right stories about Brampton? So, so Durka's question was to the panel, what have you seen as the barriers towards shifting the narratives about the city of Brampton, especially in the media? How can we work toward changing this? How can we amplify the stories of resilience and change making across the city? So coming back to where we started from, but I think it's the question of the night, how do we get better stories about Brampton being told? And uh, Councillor Santos, I'll, I'll bring it back to you to, to start this one off for us. Yeah, and thank you. Thank you, Jake Paul, for your amazing work moderating as, as always, um, and your work in the community as well. In terms of where to get started, um, you know what, Council Mayor Patrick Brown and, and Council and people here on this panel have been big ambassadors for our city whether that's every Wednesday on CP24 advocating for what we need and telling the real story of Brampton when it comes to us being hardest hit in, in the pandemic. But we are only on council 11 voices at the table. And so sometimes when I look through and peruse through social media, um, I get hurt um, seeing residents only talking about crime or only talking about the hot spot or only talking about negative things about our city. And as much as we in Brampton try to promote things like the Riverwalk Project, like Brampton University, like, um, like the plans that Yvonne has mentioned, like the work at Oslo, like the work that Gwyneth is doing, sometimes it doesn't break through. And so I, I guess like one of the biggest things that we need help on in order to start to shift the perspective of what our city is and, and our potential is, is number one, we need to believe it ourselves. And we need to believe um, that our city deserves these things, that we have this tremendous potential. And those are the stories and that is the narrative that we need to be responsible for as people who love the city that we live in and that we're raising our kids in. And so I like that I would say is one of the biggest things that I keep telling people is, is please tell the real story about our city. Um, and, and please be your own ambassador for the amazing things that we have planned for our future. I love it. I love it. Uh, Gwen, your, your, uh, your thoughts on this last question. How do we start to shift the narrative about Brampton? Um, okay. I was, this was a bit of a secret, but I guess I'm going to put it <laughs> up there right now. Um, okay. Not, okay. <laughs> this is interesting. I was thinking, do I say it here or do I not? Coming from a media background, assessing what's happening in the city of Brampton. I was saying to someone, um, you know, when we have the opportunity to be on CP24, I feel sometimes it's like, you know, you're a young kid and you're using your big sister's old shoes for some time being, and then you got to get out of it. Um, I think in terms of solution. Brampton has no television networks. No, nothing is happening over there. The city of Brampton is there to serve the people. Something as tiny as this can make big, a big difference. And it's the city of Brampton creating its own Brampton television network, period. And it's very simple. We have students, interns, be a part of reporting great stories, good news, having programs that connect the politicians to the community, having programs that reflect what's happening in the city of Brampton. Brampton can create its own media outlet and it doesn't involve a lot of funds, a lot of money. We actually do have a, a fantastic media group at the city of Brampton. 
So this is one of the things that we wanted to propose. Um, and it's interesting, I'm doing it right here. I felt compelled to bring that up because that, this is a question you're asking, what can we do? So if we cannot rely on other people to help us get our message out there and promote the, 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 the community, guess what? We have to create our own. And that's the, that's, that's the, that's the solution to this. Um, that's my thought. Anyhow, uh, Councilor Marina, you're the first to hear this. <laughs> Somebody mm -hmm. else at the, at the city mm -hmm. knows about that, probably the top person, that proposal, um, that idea. And I think it makes sense. You know, let's create and have our own City of Brampton television network, period. We can get into that, but just start to think about that. If you follow the chat, it looks like you've got a, a lot of support and, and, and viewership already signing up. So I think we can officially say this is gonna be looked back upon as a historic panel, because this is where the news broke. If only we had Brampton TV to cover it. <laughs> <laughs> Yvonne, what's, uh, what's your thoughts? How, how can we start shifting the narrative around Brampton? I think what is very interesting about the Brampton narrative is, is really a microcosm of not just Canada, but is the world. So what we are changing in here is fundamentally apply at a global scale. I think it's time for the city to position ourselves as not just a municipality within the GTA, but it's actually a um, highly valued international scale city. There's um, a lot of energy in here. There's a lot of talent. There's a lot of good news story. And we need to find a channel to, um, to connect it um, um, beyond uh, the, the physical boundary of our city. Yeah. I love that. So we got to be thinking bigger than Brampton to, to, to share the story of Brampton. Mm -hmm, absolutely. I like that. And uh, Marilyn, last, last word on this topic is yours. H how do we change the narrative around Brampton? Yeah, I think it, it almost starts as simple as claiming Brampton, certainly for young people. I grew up in a time where we were not proud to say that we were from Brampton. Somebody would ask you where you're from and you'd say, I'm from Toronto, West End, really far west. But we never grew up saying we're from Brampton, certainly at, to what Councillor Santos said, leaving the city for post-secondary education for those of us who left and then not wanting to identify with all of the problematic stereotypes that we hear in that cultural imaginary. Vision Brampton was formed to address exactly that, that if we don't actually start claiming Brampton as our own, we don't invest here emotionally uh, with our financial, you know, our, our purchasing power, if we're not investing in building the kind of city that we want to see, we're never gonna be proud of claiming it. And I think even just holding the space of unpacking some of the racism, some of the inequities that lead us to some of the challenges that people experience, take some of the sting out of the, the narrative that we hear because we're equipped with the knowledge of what produced those conditions. And it's not, it's not our fault. And so we can work together to actually build some of the solutions that design the city and the vision for our city that we want. So for me, it's as simple as that, claiming Brampton as our community, investing here and telling the stories from the perspective, from an anti-racist perspective, from an equity perspective, not about all of the scarcity, but about all of the assets, all of the abundance and all of the opportunities that young people can have here if we invest and carve out that space together. Uh, awesome, awesome final thought. Uh, I said that was the last question, but I, I'm going to say I lied because I can see we're just on time. I think we sneak in one last thing, and I'm going to ask our, our panelists to keep your answers to 30 seconds or less. But I just want to get one last question, and that is, uh, you know, we're joined tonight by a number of emerging and aspiring leaders in our community. Um, what advice would you give them before we sign off for the evening? Uh, Yvonne, in 30 seconds, what, what would you tell a young leader in our community? What's your most important piece of advice? I would say do it with passion and don't be afraid to take brave steps. And uh, to make uh, sustainable changes, it means systematic changes, but it also means uh, reaching out and building a collaboration. And it's very important to build champions across with all the network that uh, you can possibly imagine. Awesome. Gwen, what's, what's your piece of advice? My piece of advice is take time to know yourself you have power, you have greatness, and you have purpose in you. There's a reason why you're born. So oh. have confidence in yourself and go for it. I want just daily affirmations from Gwen. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's, a, that, that's an app I would subscribe to 100%. <laughs> Marilyn, what's, uh, what's your piece of advice? 
Uh, yeah, exactly what I said. Lean into community here. We have the name of a city, but we feel a lot like a community here. And so leaning as much as possible into that community spirit, building coalitions, building collaboration. Um, we're, we're stronger together, and I really feel that we can build a Brampton that serves all of us. And that's that's kind of what I want to leave people with. Awesome. And uh, Rowena, Councillor Santos? Um, yes, thank you. Um, so when when you are up for change, when you want to challenge and change the status quo, you're going to be faced with brick walls or walls in front of you. Instead of spray painting graffiti on that wall, smash through it like the Incredible Hulk um, and, and just persevere and get through. I'm an Avengers fan, so I will always <laughs> make an Avengers reference. Smash through those walls like the Incredible Hulk and just keep going. I love it. I, I have a last comment. Uh, this is very important. Um, Jepal? Yes, of course. I, yeah, is, this is very much on a serious note, but I would like to really get your take. What does it feel like being in the room with four incredible women? 30 seconds. <laughs> I'm, I, I feel very fortunate. And, and overwhelmed by, by all the powerful energy here. I love, there was so much passion, so much love for one another. Gwen, I want you in my life just clapping in the background the way you were on this call. And, and, and for me, you know, the, the, I, I got you know, a lesson from each of you on this call. You know, uh, not, it's not about civic engagement, it's about civic inclusion. You know, city building is like a soccer game. Everyone has something great to contribute to this city and please be your own ambassador. I think you, you gave us a lot of gems tonight. I feel very fortunate to be part of the conversation. And uh, thank you to Civic Action and the Emerging Leaders Network for letting us have this conversation tonight. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Good job, Rebecca, good answer. Back over to you. Amazing. Thank you so much to all of our panelists, to Jay Paul's our fantastic moderator. I think I can speak for everyone when I say that was a fantastic panel. There was so much passion um, and we're, we're really looking forward to, to staying connected with all of you. So thank you so, so much again. So we're now gonna be moving on to um, our interactive discussion group portion of the evening. So we have two incredible Brampton-based rising leaders who will be facilitating discussion groups with us. And so um, we really encourage as many of you as possible to stay on the line to participate because um, this is where we kind of turn to you um, and we hear your thoughts, your reflections on, the, on what was shared in the panel, but also your ideas um, on, on how Brampton can be building back better and what the future of Brampton should look like. So our facilitators tonight, we have Harpreet Singh, who's the president of the County Court Neighborhood Association and was also a speaker at our 2021 ELN Pechacucha Night. Um, and we're also joined tonight by Just Curran Sandhu, who's a senior consultant at Crestview Strategy and a Diversity Fellows alumni. So two fantastic people here to facilitate these discussions. So what's gonna happen? You'll see that um, my colleague has just shared a link in the chat. So at 8 p.m., you can click that link and you'll join um, our, our second Zoom call, which is where we'll be accessing breakout rooms to have smaller, more interactive group discussions. Our facilitators will be taking notes of some of the, the key takeaways that we hear from you. And we'll actually be putting together a report on our ELN Spotlight blog um, to share back what we heard from both our panelists and from our discussion groups tonight. So just before we leave this webinar, um, just a couple closing notes for you. So firstly, um, you'll see a poll come up on your screen in just a moment or two here. This is a very, very quick way um, for you to share feedback with us about this event. So we really appreciate you just taking a minute um, to, to fill this out. Um, and, and while you're doing that, um, I, I just wanted to highlight two ways that you can stay involved with civic action in the ELN. So firstly, of course, please join the ELN. Stay engaged with us at hashtag ELN online. Um, so you can use leadership.civicaction.ca slash ELN uh, to quickly sign up for the mailing list and become a part of the Emerging Leaders Network. Uh, secondly, you can become a higher next employer. So if you work in the Peel region um, or even beyond the Peel region, uh, we are um, looking for more higher next employers. So if, if you believe that your organization could better attract and retain diverse young talent, you can take our totally free higher next assessment at civicaction.ca slash higher next. Um, or you could just forward that along to someone in your organization. 
So with that, um, we will be heading off of this call. We'll be heading to the new Zoom link. So it's in the chat. I think my colleague will reshare it again. So it's at the, the very top of mind here, but it's also in your email um, that we sent you this morning as a registrant. Um, so you can also check back your email, find that link, and we will see you there at eight o'clock. So thank you again so much to our panelists. Thank you to our audience. And we hope to see you in the discussion groups. Take care, everyone.